We're going to be in Colossians chapter number 3, starting in verse 1. So we, we just ended last week in chapter 2. Um, before we start to dive into the Word, I'm going to read a few verses, and we'll have a word of prayer. <clears throat> All right, Colossians chapter number 3. Look with me at verse 1. Our Apostle Paul writes, he says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your precious uh, grace. We thank you for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ shed on Calvary's cross for our sins, Father. We thank you for that everlasting and eternal uh, sacrifice of your Son, where you made him sin for us, Father. The one who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Thank you for that blessedness, Father. Thank you for your marvelous grace and this present dispensation of grace. We thank you for the Holy Scriptures, Father, that we can learn more and more about uh, your Son and his sacrifice on the cross. And, and not just his death, but his, his resurrection, Father, that, that life that he's given us uh, when we trust him by faith. Thank you, Father, for the walk of faith. May we uh, look into your, your uh, Scriptures tonight. May you give us great wisdom and insight and understanding uh, and discernment, Father. Uh, may we appreciate your Son more at the end of this study. Uh, may it be glorifying to you and edifying to us. And we thank you in the name of your precious Son, our glorious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul starts off chapter 3 by saying, If ye then be risen with Christ. And if ye then is in essence of since ye are. That's a truth uh, of the grace believer. When, when you trust Christ as your Savior, when we trust Him as our Savior, we're, we, we're crucified with Him, Paul says. We're buried with him, Romans 6, and we're raised together with him. And God desires that truth to be in our lives. And when he says, if you then be risen with Christ, which means in order to be risen from the dead, you had to die first, right? Paul talks about you're dead. Notice here, uh, verse cha chapter 20 of verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 20. Look at verse 20 of chapter 2. Colossians 2, 20. Uh, speaking of being dead with Christ. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ, from the rudiments of the world, and we are, when we trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> God took us out of this lost, sin-cursed world where Adam had dominion, and he put us in his Son, the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 20 again, chapter 2. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ, and that's, that has to do with positional truth, okay? When Christ died, we died with him. Although his death took place, uh, we were talking about it, I was talking with John earlier today, Christ died at a certain point in time in human history, but all the sacrifices from Adam on, those 4,000 years, were types and shadows of his death. Go back with me, if you will, to Romans. Go to Romans chapter number 3. When Paul talks about if he'd be dead with Christ, how can someone living in 2015 be dead with Christ? Well, look at Romans chapter number 3. The, 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 the cross is an eternal thing. Even in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, uh, from the foundation of the world, the lamb, the lamb was slain. And what happened was, when God slew that lamb and clothed Adam and Eve, that was a picture, a type and shadow of Christ's righteousness. His shed blood and his covering. Look with me at Romans chapter number 3. Paul is talking about the righteousness of God today. Look at verse number 21. Start at verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, and that deeds of the law has to do with that performance-based acceptance system God gave the nation of Israel, the, the, the old covenant of the law of Moses, where it was a short account system of works to be right with God. When you sinned against God, you had to offer the proper sacrifice and so forth. Well, Paul says in verse 20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh, and the no flesh, the reason he says no flesh, he's talking about both Jew and Gentile. Even though God gave the, the law to the nation of Israel, they couldn't keep it either. And that's what Paul said. Look at verse 19. Paul says, now, now that's, this is a dispensational understanding. Today we know that whatsoever things the law saith, and that law has to do with that law of Moses given to Israel, it saith to them who are under the law. Israel looked at the law, and they, when those laws were saying that, that people were unjust and all that, they said, yeah, God, all those Gentiles are unjust. Romans chapter 3 verse 9 what then are we in the context the we is the, the Jews better than they the Gentiles 
Watch what Paul says. No in no wise. We're, the Jews were no better than the Gentiles, even though the Jews were God's people in time past. For we, that's Paul and, and, and those ministers, for we have before proved, in Romans 1 and 2, Paul has proven that both Jews and Gentiles were guilty before Almighty God. He says, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under what? Sin. So whether it was the Gentiles or the Jews, where Paul proved that they all under sin. Because the Jews thought that those bad things that the law said uh, uh, was talking about the Gentiles. Notice in verse 10. Verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Um, our, <clears throat> pardon me. This track here, we put together this gospel track to share God's grace with people. And people sometimes think that they're good enough in their own works to please God. And so we're teaching them that no one is good enough in their own standing before God. You're dead in your sins. So in Romans chapter number 3, verse 10, Paul says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Look at verse 11. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. Think about that. Without God giving you enlightenment from His Word, no one can understand no one naturally seeks after God. He has to make the first move. We did that study on Adam and Eve. God found them. They were hiding amongst the trees of the garden when they sinned. God looked for them. Well, if God didn't take the first step, none of us would know him. Notice here, verse 12. They are all gone out of the way, the way of rectitude or righteousness. They are together become unprofitable. Mankind was, was created by God for his profit, for his, for his use. But without him, it's unprofitable. Verse number 12. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And so that Romans wrote, you use all these things. Go down to verse 20 again. Chapter 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh, and that's Jewish flesh or Gentile flesh, be justified in his sight. So why did God give the law to Israel under Moses? Well, look at the rest of that verse, Paul says. For by the law is the knowledge of what? Sin. I always like to use that thing when you're driving down the interstate. You see 65 miles per hour. If you look down, you're doing 75. You're okay. You know, you're but then when you see the California Highway Patrol on the side, you're really looking. And you're looking back to see if he's coming. Because the law says 65, but you break, you're breaking the law. Well, that was the law of Moses for Israel. Everywhere they looked, it pointed out that they were sinners. It pointed out that they were sons and daughters of Adam. But look what God did. Look at verse 21. <clears throat> but now. Now when you see but now, that's the change. And when Paul does a but now, usually he's talking about this is the way it was before the dispensation of grace, and this is how it is today. Now notice, but now the righteousness of God, what's those next three words? Without the law. So let me do my chart here. So for those who <clears throat> may be new to this, we always have new folk. Before Acts 9, when Paul got saved, Saul, when Saul, when the Lord Jesus Christ came down out of heaven's glory and saved the chief of sinners, Saul. Saul, Saul, why persecute thou me? Saul was an enemy of the Lord Jesus. All that time back there to Moses, God was dealing with man, particularly Israel, under the law. Well, what when Paul comes on the scene, God is now dealing with mankind under his grace. Saul was not worthy to be saved by God's grace. He was the first man to be saved by grace through faith plus no works. All back here, they had to do the works of the law. Okay, Even before uh, the law, Adam to Moses. From Adam to Moses, although the law wasn't given, they still had to be under a sacrifice system. Yeah, there was all types of things that God held them accountable. Everybody back to Adam had to do some type of sacrifice or have to do some type of works, okay? Even under the Lord's earthly ministry, he says, go and offer the sacrifice Moses commanded. So yes, thank you, Dick. Saul comes along. He was a Jew under that law. When Christ comes down and saves him in Acts 9, he saved him by his grace. Saul didn't do anything. He received the Lord Jesus Christ. And from that time, God has been dealing with folks under the dispensation of grace. And now it's grace through faith plus no works. That's what Paul says to him that worketh not. 
And that was what God began doing right there with the salvation of Saul. So when he says, but now, go back to uh, Romans 3. The but now is a, is a time in history when God dealing with man that even though he dealt with man under, if you want to think about law, think about religion. Re, religion. See the word legion, legion? Re is to bind again. Legion is to look. Uh, re is again and ligaments to bind. God was dealing with man on religion or a performance-based acceptance. You can be right with God, but you have to perform in order to be right in his eye. Well, when dispensation of grace came, and we now know from Paul, it's going to be right here when, on, at Calvary where the blood was shed, and then he let that he let that be known. The reason Christ came out of heaven's glory to Saul, Paul, was to let mankind know that because of the blood at Calvary, shed, shed at Calvary by our Lord, now God can offer his grace for a time. One day it's going to end with the rapture, okay? Sometime soon, the rapture, the resurrection, and the judgment of Christ. But for the past nearly 2,000 years, God has been saving men by grace through faith plus no works. That's why he says the but now. So when he talks about but now, he's talking about the present dispensation of grace. Let's look at it. But now, verse 21, the righteousness of God. In time past, God's righteousness was inherent in the law. If a man wanted to be right with God, it says about John the Baptist's parents, their name was Zacharias and Elizabeth, Luke 1, 5 and 6. He says they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinance of the law blamelessly. And they walked in the law. That was God's righteousness. You were right before God. Well, today, look with me in, in verse 21. But now, the righteousness of God, don't miss this, without the law is manifested. God had it, but he never manifested it. With the Apostle Paul, God began to manifest that righteousness of God without the law. And so now, God doesn't use the law, remember? He, 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 he abolished those commandments and ordinances. And now you're going to be right with God positionally. This is our position. Not through law, but grace. You're not under law, Paul says, Romans 6, 14. You're under grace. God changed the dispensation because the blood of his son was shed at Calvary. And after Israel, one year after his resurrection, after Israel rejected the preaching of Peter and the 12 apostles, Stephen. they stoned Stephen. They said, we don't want that man to reign over us. Speaking of the Lord, God says, fine, I'm going to set Israel aside, and I'm going to send salvation out to the Gentiles, and that's the section of your Bible where the Apostle Paul. So you have Genesis, where Adam is, all the way through Acts. And God has been dealing with mankind one way. When you come to Paul's 13 epistles, Romans through Philemon, that's where you find the information for the grace dispensation. That's where you're saved by grace. Your walk is a walk of faith. Where Israel had to do works in order to be right with God and get into the kingdom. We get into the kingdom by faith. And what happens is our works that we're created for are for what? Reward. And that's what the judgment seat of Christ is all about. At the end, at the rapture. Let's keep looking at this. Look at verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Now, see, it was manifested, but it, it didn't mean that God didn't have it there. He just didn't reveal it. That's what the mystery is about. He says, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And in verse 22, he tells you specifically, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Because the Lord Jesus was faithful, because he was perfectly obedient to the Father, even unto death, he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, of rejection, where he was made sin, God now is able to pour out his grace. He, he uses the faith of Jesus Christ, and he imputes that faith to you and me when we trust him. So the moment we trust Christ, God, he imputes Jesus Christ's faith to us. Notice what Paul says. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Now notice, notice who it's unto. It's unto what? All. 
not just the, the, the Jews, not just to certain people, the elect, so it's unto all. But notice, it comes upon all, and upon all them that do what? Believe. Believe. That's where your faith comes in. Your faith, the moment you trust Christ, it taps into his faithfulness. Like our Ryan said, he's the power source, and we tap in. Um, when, you, when you have to jump a car, your car battery is down, you need another source, and you put some, some jumper cables, and you put that cables, and then you can start your car, right, because of the power there. Where you're dead, just like that battery. And all you have is some jumper cables, and God gives you, he says, now connect them to my son. And then he makes you alive. Because when we get back to Colossians, we were raised with Christ. Let's finish here. <clears throat> Verse number 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. There's your faith. For there is no difference. Now, in context, you talk about there's no difference between the Jew or the Gentile. The Jews thought that they were better. At a time, they were. But when God changed that dispensation to grace, the Jews were no better than Gentiles. God concluded them all in unbelief. The Jews had a standard above all the nations. But when they stoned Stephen, God cast them down to the same level with us dirty Gentiles. And that's because he calls us dogs. Gentile dogs. Uncircumcised dogs. And now a Jew has to come to God the same way a Gentile. By humbling himself and trusting the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. That's the only way to God. Both Jew and Gentile. Gentiles called unclean too. So unclean. Same thing. Same thing. Yeah. yeah. We're all sinners. That's right. Well, well, let's let's look at it. Verse twenty-two. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned, both Jew and Gentile, and come short of the glory of God. You know, Ryan made a good point. Sometimes, and we all do it because it's just how it's just how our brains work. Sometimes. Sometimes it's quoted for all of sin and falls short of the glory of God, right? And, and on, on the surface, they say, oh, well, that's true. A lot but, of modern Bible say that. That's well, yeah. Let's well, see. To fall, this says come short. So look at, the, look at the direction. Here's God's glory up here. Here's man down here. To fall short means you are already up there, right? So if you fall short. But Paul says you come short. You can't get there without Christ. Mm -hmm. Even something that subtle. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now verse 24. Being justified. That's that word righteous. Justified how? Free. Freely. In time past, you had to do something in order to receive justification. Here God offers it freely how? By His grace. And His grace came through the redemption, the Redeemer, that is in whom? Christ Jesus. Now, in verse 25, you remember I said that God, when he looked back in time, well, excuse me, not when he looked back, when he was back in, in, with man in time past before the cross, the reason he could allow Adam to all these guys, to, to, to Paul, to offer blood sacrifices is because God saw, he knew the cross was coming. The reason why we could be crucified with Christ 2015 is we looking back to it. That, that, that cross is, is eternal. And whether you're pre-cross or post-cross, God centers everything in the cross. That's what Paul is saying. Look what he says here. Verse 25. Whom God, speaking of the Lord, hath set forth. To set something forth, you put it out there just like that. God says, people say, God, I want to know you. He says, here, here's my son. Here's my son. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. That's, that's a good uh, old English way of saying a fully, a fully satisfying payment. You don't need anything else. A lot of people say, well, I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, but really they're trusting something else with Him. You know, water baptism, some type of church attendance, some type of tithing. Some, something in their mind, they're saying, yeah, I trusted Christ, but in, in their mind, they have to add something to it. Well, God didn't, he doesn't want that. He wants you to say, short of the blood of Christ, there's nothing I can offer you, God. There's nothing I can do. And he says, that's what I want. Because notice the propitiation is through faith, verse 25, in his what? His blood. It's through faith in his blood. That's the only thing God accepts. And all the way back to Adam, when God first 
because of Adam's sin, killed that first little innocent baby lamb, it was a type and shadow of the Lord Jesus. And God sh shed his blood and showed Adam, bring the blood. That's the whole thing with Cain and Abel. Cain brought the fruit of the cursed ground. His brother brought the blood of that animal. And the fact there of a type of Christ. And you had to do that by faith. God told him to do that. Notice here. Oh, by the way, Cain, he was a farmer. I'm sure those crops were the best. Oh, uh, Ryan's family have an organic farm. I'm still sure that what he brought with Ryan on the surface was a lot better than what y'all can uh, produce now, you know, because of the curse, you know. And that was early. But as good as those fruits of his cursed ground was, they could not get him right with God. God says, if you do well, you'll be accepted. But if you don't, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over it. The only thing that can deal with sin is blood, innocent blood. There's power. It only was for a short time until Christ. That's the right. If, if short time in God's view, 4,000 years. That's yeah, right. He's showing mankind, okay, get, get, the, get the idea. There's power in that blood. There's power in the blood. There's power in innocent blood. Understand, that's what's behind abortion. Because there's power. The, uh, Satan and then the, the powers of darkness, they get power for, from innocent blood. Dear God. Yes. Oh. God forbid. Those folks who right. kill those innocents. Oh, man. Mm. At that great white throne. Exactly. They're in trouble. They're murdering babies. And, and what's behind it, why it's such a push, is because they want to give power to their master, Satan. And innocent blood is power. And there's not a greater innocent blood than the Lord Jesus. And that's the power to take us from death to life. Notice where notice it says, verse 25, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his what? Blood. God the Father has faith in his blood. So when God allowed man to sacrifice the blood of bulls and goats, which Hebrews then says to the people, he says, listen. Oh yeah, Hebrews to Revelation. So after Paul's epistles, you get back to God's dealing with the Hebrews through Revelation. Okay, then the kingdom comes. But the point is, he says, the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. But why did God do it then? Well, let's read it. Verse 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness... For the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Here's what Paul is saying. God allowed mankind for 4,000 years to sacrifice the blood of bulls and goats and sheep and all these other animals. And he was right to do it. Because if you look at it, how is that right, God? Man is made in your image. Those are just animals. They don't, it doesn't work. He said, hold on, I got something coming. He knew. He forbeared it. That's what he's saying. Look at it. To declare his righteousness for the remission. They got remission of sins. We get forgiveness. It's a difference. In time past, under this performance-based acceptance, you know what remission is. Like cancer, people, cancers go into remission. What it means, it could be come back. And in Ezekiel 18, he says the righteous could be righteous, righteous, righteous. He could then he could commit iniquity, walk in that iniquity, and die in his sins. See, theirs could come, be remitted. Well, what we got under grace is forgiveness of sins. No sin that we commit will keep us out of God's heaven. Now, our sins that go to the judgment seat of Christ, they affect our reward. Grace is not licensed. Unless confessed. Unless repented of right. God gives you... By the way, all through Scripture... When man sins, God gives him space to repent. God is not ready to just pound everybody, right? Wait, you sin, boom, you sin, you death. No, he, he sends prophets to tell him. He sends people, hey, repent. He tells Israel, repent. Your, all the prophets say, repent, repent, repent. He gives you space. But if they go unrepentant, for them, they go to hell. That's why David cried, take not thy spirit away from me, thy Holy Spirit away, in Psalm 51. He committed adultery and murder, and he was fearful God had mercy on him. Yes. Didn't mean he still didn't deal with the consequences. All types of stuff happened. But we get forgiveness, they got remission. So the remission of sins that are past, it was, verse 25, it was through the forbearance of God. He forbeared, why? He forbeared knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ would one day shed his blood on the cross. Knowing. He knew. Looking forward. God looked forward. Well, 
It's interesting, we say God before, but he's everywhere. Yeah. God just knew. <laughs> he was there. Well then, what about, if that's before the cross, what about those of us who live 2,000 years future? How can someone read this track, believe it, believe the word, and get saved today? Or hear the gospel, that I should say the track, this is a good way to present it, but how can someone get saved today, 2,000 years after the cross? Well, notice, verse number 26. To declare, Paul says, I say, now when Paul says I say, he's saying, this is unique to me. I say, Paul is the apostle of grace. Peter and the twelve, they're all apostles of the kingdom and the law. Paul is the grace, great apostle, the grace apostle. He said, declare, I say, and you know it's specific to this time, because he says, at this what? Time. What time, Paul? The dispensation of grace. His righteousness. That he might be just. God's going to do the right thing. He doesn't sweep sin under the rug like I do when I sweep the floor. I just pick the rug up, sweep it under the end. And God doesn't do that. You're that. I know, Kristen. You're that, Kristen. I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> I sweep at church. I sweep outside. Okay, that's all I'm I got to be a nice, beautiful woman here. She's, she's very beautiful. But I do sweep out there. I just sweep into the parking lot. Well, God just don't sweep the dust around. He deals with God. He vacuums them up. Vacuums it up. Watch this. He says, verse 26, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just. He deals with sin. And the justifier, there's the future, the justifier of him which believeth in who? Jesus. Jesus. So everybody post-cross who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did at Calvary, God can justify them too. He can give them positional righteousness. Now they're saved by grace forever. That's why Paul says, go back to Colossians 3, 1. Go to Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. God says that we're dead with Christ, Romans 6. He says we're buried with Christ, Romans 6. And we're raised together with Christ. And positionally, that's our righteousness. We have the same standing for God the Father that the Lord Jesus Christ has, positionally. Now, Paul always wants our position to be matched. Now, this is the hard part. To be matched by our practice. There's positionally and then there's practically. Everything that we are in Christ here, positionally, God, and that's what you're doing right now. You're learning the word. This is sanctification. He's trying to make your practice match your position. You see that? And that's what the life of a believer is all about. Why do we study the word and build Christ? Because God says, here's who I made you. Now strive to be that. The only way you can do it is by faith. So Paul lets us know. Look at Colossians chapter number 3. That's what he's trying to implore the believer. Verse, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, and positionally we are, aren't we? Yes. When Christ rose from the dead, we rose from the dead. Spiritually speaking. Seek. Now to seek something means there's effort there. You have to look for it. Right. This is, this is a choice you make. Seek. The, the, this is search and seek in the scriptures. You've got to put some effort in here. Seek those things which are what? Above. See, Paul doesn't want the believer to worry about the things of this world. The rudiments, he calls them, of this world. Go back to chapter 2, verse 20. Colossians 2, verse 20. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ, and we are positionally, from the rudiments of this of the of the world. What's the rudiments? How the world does things, the rudimentary things. You know, when you when children go to school, there's there's preschool and, and then kindergarten, our girls in first grade and all this. And you gotta learn these basics. And we forget that. It's interesting having a little child, we're just driving, she's reading everything, right? And you forget she spells out words exactly how they sound. <laughs> she would she was Bob and Rita. Rita is spelled R-I-T-A. So Jada likes to, she's so artistic, she likes to make everybody a card. And she wants to spell Rita R-E-E-T-A. 
<laughs> Rita. That's what I mean. She might even, because she's from the hood, put a R E E D A. Rita. That's how I said Rita. Well, that's that's how the basics of, of how children learn. That's the phonics. It's, yeah. it's crazy to them that you have two words that sound alike and have different spellings yeah. and different meanings. That's confusing to them. Maybe it is if it, uh, our brother there has, it has English as a second language. Probably learning that. Because, but see, the, the world does things a certain way. Look at verse 20. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? And, and we went through all of those things in our last study. Ryan he posted, or you know, he, posted, he might have even posted it by then. But here's the point. Paul says, we are dead with Christ, but because he rose, we rose. Verse chapter 3, verse 1. If ye, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Which are the things above. We're about to see that. Good. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Where Christ, here's a clue, though, you watch this. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Now let's talk about that. Which is authority. Right, exactly, exactly right. Doty. Let's look at this. When Paul says where Christ sitteth on the right hand, that's a key. Because when Christ ascended up into the heavens, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, the Father, right? In the Bible, a right hand means power. That's why most people are right hand. Except me here, I'm right with my left hand. I'm, I'm powerless. I don't, know. It means power and authority, okay? Thou art my son. You know, this day have I begotten you. Sit here on my right hand until I make... Your foes, your footstool. Power and authority. So what is Paul saying? Well, the book of Colossians is about our faithfulness to the Lord. Because when you're faithful to Him, there is power and authority of reigning, ruling and reigning with Him. Okay? That's what it's all about. That's what the whole book is about, Colossians. Go with me to chapter 3. Let me show you something. Look at chapter 3, down at the end. Watch how he ends the chapter. We'll get to it in detail when we get there. But look at verse uh, 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily. Over in Ephesians it says, with all your heart. As to the Lord. And what's, what's the term Lord means? Righteous. The righteous judge. The, so when you see him called the Lord, Jesus Christ. That's his full due. People just call him Jesus. But when he rose from the dead, Luke said, the Lord Jesus. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord, when Paul called him Lord... That's the righteous judge. That means he's going to judge us righteously and judge us in righteousness. But the focus is he's a judge. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is all about. Jesus, that has to do with his humanity, okay? Why he is able. He became the son of God, became the son of man. You can't stand before him and say, well, Jesus, you didn't know. You went, well, I was a man. Look at the holes. Look at the holes. Look at the Calvary. And Christ, well, there you go. You get the suffering. Tested on all points, yet without, yep. without, yep, without sin. sin. Uh, the sufferings of Christ and the glory. That's the reason calls the judgment seat of Christ, because he's going to see how much you suffered with him and how much you will reign together. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And so when Paul says, seek those things, he's saying, put away these things. Notice, notice let's look at that. Tonight, tonight's study is called Set Your Affection. Uh, what did I tell you? Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as, as to the Lord and not unto men. Why? Knowing that of the Lord, of the righteous judge, Paul calls him 2 Timothy 4, ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. That's that joint inheritance Paul talks about in Romans 8, where he shares his rule and reign in heavenly places. You shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve, who? The Lord Christ. He's going to reward you with glory for suffering with Him. That's our focus. That's how you endure these things. Look, go back to, um, go back to chapter 3, verse, one, verse, verse 2. Sorry, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. So, the main thing you want to see, uh, he, he brought it up in Colossians 1, don't he? Look at Colossians 1 again. Uh, Colossians 1, look at verse 14. Give me a second to get some water here. What are those things that are above? The first verse of your Bible makes it clear. <clears throat> Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning... 
God created the what? Heaven and the earth. So his kingdom, his king's domain, or his king's dominion, is in two spheres. He breaks it up, heaven and earth. From Genesis 1, verse 2, all the way over to Acts chapter 9, where Paul will say God was only dealing with the earth. Nation of Israel will be kings and priests and reign, rule and reign with him on the earth, it says in Revelation. They're going to rule over the Gentiles. God began a, a program to reconcile the earth back into himself that Satan and his angels had usurped. God kept quiet about how he would reconcile the heavenly kingdom. That's what the mystery is until Paul. And so from this time, Satan began trying to destroy the seed of the woman. He, he, had, he had his angels uh, try to just corrupt the seed line back in, in Genesis. That's where the flood came. Um, when God put it into the Hebrew people, he started to focus on Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their people, trying to exterminate the, the, the people where this Messiah would come to, to, to get the earth back. Adam was created a one new man was created by God to reconcile the earth back into sin. Now, he fell, but the last man, the second Adam, the Lord Jesus, he succeeded. And the Lord Jesus will rule, I was talking to John earlier, one day he will literally rule and reign on this earth from the Middle East there. But that's not all God's kingdom. He has a heavenly kingdom, 2 Timothy 4. That's right. That's why the body of Christ was created. In the heavenlies, this great book called In the Heavenlies. That's what's not being taught. It's not. People focus on the earth. But God created the body of Christ to rule and reign in heaven. Let me show you what Paul says, Colossians 1 16. Speaking of, start at verse number 11. Verse 12. Colossians 1 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet, or that's fit or proper, to be partakers. Remember, we were just talking about that inheritance. To make us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. Where? In light. Hold that thought. Who have delivered us from the power of darkness. Remember I said that innocent blood being shed when they, when they, when they killed, murdered those babies. is to give power to the darkness of this world. That's, that's why the Lord Jesus Christ, I, I took it down, but his blood is the most powerful innocent blood ever. And that's the power to take us out of that darkness into light. And it's this battle for power, Satan's kingdom, Christ's kingdom. Innocent blood is power. Notice this, you're going to see it in a minute. That's a position, our position. But it's also the power that we walk by. I'll get to that. Yeah, so it's a position and practice. Verse 13. Who have delivered us from the, you know, Paul talks about the preaching of the cross. But unto us is to say it's the power of God. Right. Look at verse 13. Who have delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us. He literally, to translate means to take something out of one place and put it into another. That's the position. That's right. What, what Brother uh, David has, he has a King James Bible, but it has Korean. It, so it's English and Korean. And it's translated. The, 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 the Korean is translated from the English from, from King James. That's a translation. Well, God has done that with us Gentiles. He's taken us out of Satan's kingdom and put us, notice, has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Oh, man. That word dear, you call your wife dear or your child dear? Can't live without you. Can't live without you. Can't live. Y'all know. It's good food. There you go. Can't live, cannot, cannot. So when the Bible does cannot like that, that's cannot live without you. Without you. Where is that scripturally? It's what the word means. It's just a definition of the word. Yeah. This is what I see. There's no scripture that says, okay, dear means that. But when you look it up, which I do, I look up all the words, right. that's the sense. It's like, it, 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 it's, it's used in the Bible. Okay. It's, it's the same as, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The, look, the God the Father does not want to live without son. He sees us. When he says his dear son, it's in that sense of his beloved son that he doesn't want to live without. You know why he rose him from the dead? Because that's my son. He's going to rule for me. God sees us the same way because of Christ. All right. <clears throat> look, look here. So his dear son, verse number 14. What about his dear son? In whom we have redemption. What did we learn in Romans? 
The way we have that redemption is through His blood. It's the power of His blood. We have redemption through His blood. And He tells you, even, even means that that specifically is the forgiveness of sin. Remember, they got remission of sins in time past because they were under the law, performance. So it come back on them. I can tell you this. You can get, I, it happened to me back in Chicago. The reason I was a good driver, I drive to this day, is I was 20 years old. I got a ticket in, 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 in one of the interstates in Chicago, the Dan Ryan Expressway. Speeding, like a young goof. <laughs> now in Illinois, unlike Minnesota, or, I'm not sure California, no, but they take your license away and you got to go back to court and get it. So I'm driving on the ticket. He writes me a ticket up a day. I got called for speeding again. Before I got my license back, the state trooper says, where are you going? I was going to play baseball. I was a ball player. I said, going to practice, sir. Sorry, I'm a little late. He goes, let me give me your license and registration. I said, well, I got this ticket. <laughs> He's like, now, you know, according to law, I'm supposed to take your car right now and take you in there. Okay. I mean, like, I'm already on ticket. But he saw my baseball bats and stuff. He says, you know, he started at him and said, okay, go and play. He said, just slow. He said, slow down. He gave, you some he gave me a warning. He said, slow down. I still speed, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm way better. But, but I don't ever, I, I tell my wife, that meant a lot. He could have took me in. He could have got me. But he gave me a warning and he let me off. He was merciful to me, right? God, in time past, would have given them a ticket. You say, well, Lord, I, I cleared that thing before, but no, 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 you did it again. Now clear it again. Clear it again. again. That's remission. That's why they had to do it every year. Every year. Three times a year they had to go Three worship. Three times? Three times. At, at, uh, uh, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. They had, to shed the they had to keep doing it year after year. Whereas, just like that man let me off, he says, you're free to go. Go and see. He basically said, go and see no more. Sin sin no one can tell it. Like, Lord, to the Lord. Okay. But here's the point. It's through that blood. Chapter 2, verse 14. In, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. See, that's what we have as grace believers. Speaking of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now, we talked about that when we were in that study. That firstborn, that has to do with his inheritance to rule. Firstborn. In Israel, the firstborn got the double portion. Deuteronomy 21, 2 Chronicles 20. What happens is, he blessed all his children, but the firstborn, he got the rule of the house. He got the rule of the house. It says he gave, this king would have a son, he got multiple sons. Which son will rule in his stead? Well, the firstborn. All his sons were, were princes, or, you know, they, they were his sons. He blessed them, but he gave the rulership to his firstborn. That's what it means. This is what we share in that joint inheritance for suffering with him in the mystery. Let me show you here. Is that why God killed the firstborn of the Egyptians? Yes. There was a, there was the, sim, the symbolism there is, I'm going to destroy the pride of your power. Right. Because Pharaoh says, oh, what a son represented in that culture is, this is my prodigy, so my name will live on, right? Right. My seed will live on. So even when I die... Here's my seed. Cain, God says, you're going to be a vagabond. You, you, you're going to... Cain says, no, nope, I'm going to build me a city and I'm going to name it after my son. He was mocking God. He says, I might die, but my name is going to live on through my son. God says, let me show you how to make your name live on through your son. God's going to rule and reign through his son and those who are innocent. Look, look at what he says here. Talk about that son, verse number 16, for by him were all things created. I was sharing with... Uh, David's brother Alex, he's not here tonight, but he's a, he was an atheist, now he believes in God, but I was trying to show him about the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus created everything. In John chapter 1, I gave him, he was, he was willing, I gave him some passages. If you want to teach people about God, three passages, and it's very simple, you don't want to give a lost person too much. Genesis 1, where everything came from, who did it, and then God created All Everything you see, he created man, Genesis 1, 26. In John 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word was made flesh, right? Verse 14. So that God became a man, Jesus of Nazareth. And then in Romans 1, that man who's God is going to judge you for your sins. So get right. And he tells you how to get right. So I would give these, 
This is the Godhead. One, one, one. Three and one. Boom, boom, boom. Now, in John, notice it says, all things were created by him and for him. That's what John says. That's the Lord Jesus, the, the invisible God, the image of the, verse 16. For by him were all things created. So, though you said, what are those things up there? Such a picture of things above. Notice, that are in heaven and that are in earth. First verse of your Bible, heaven and earth. God is telling us right from the beginning, this is what it's all about, everybody. First verse of my book is the heaven and the earth. And he, he educates us on the earth. It is not until you come to Acts 9, the Apostle Paul, he's the heavenly apostle. He's going to talk to you about the heavenly places, Ephesians talks about. Let's keep going. Verse number 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Now, watch this. Visible. Which, would, which ones would that be? You see. The one you can see is on the earth. And invisible. We can't see it with our human eyes, but it's there. Whether they be. Now, watch this. Thrones. What you do with a throne? You reign on them. There are millions. This is the, the domain, principalities. There's those uh, other uh, uh, positions of authority under there and powers. All things were created by him and for him. But wait a minute. Jesus Christ is just one man. Even though he's God, he's in the, he's in the man Christ Jesus. So how, if he's down here on earth, which he will be uh, after the rapture, you're going to have a little ten, uh, period, I believe, most likely 10 years, but that, you know, it's just speculation. The Antichrist, the Lord's going to be doing the judgment seat of Christ up here for the body. And then there's going to be a seven-year period. You heard about the tribulation of seven, Daniel's 70th week, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble for Israel. And at the end of that seven-year period, when Christ is coming down, gonna he's going to reign on the earth. From the Mount of Olives. Well, from the Mount Zion, yeah. The Mount of Olives would be... It, it's a... It's a if, if you know that the New Jerusalem's coming down with him, Dodie, it's about two-thirds the size of the United States. That's a huge city. Yeah. It's basically all the Arabian Peninsula, which God promised Abraham. Right. That's what's going on over the Middle East. They're fighting over that land. That's what they're fighting for. <laughs> but the point is, if the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be down here, and he will, his feet, the Lord Jesus Christ, will touch the Mount of Olives and so That's what you were thinking about, Zechariah said. Mm -hmm. How is he going to reign in the heavenly kingdom? Because there's a whole... Look at this. Verse 16. For by him all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible, the ones on earth, invisible ones in heaven, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things are created by him and for him. For him. Well, if he's going to be down here, how is he going to reign in the heavenly places? Through the church, which is his body, the church, the body of Christ. The body of Christ was created by Almighty God. To rule and reign in heaven. That's why at the rapture we meet him in the air. And we ever be with the Lord. He, 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 after the judgment seat, he takes us right to God the Father. And God the Father places us in the heavenly kingdom. Forever. I've been here since I was 12 years old. And I've only learned this in the last two years. Been in the Bible for I know 2,000 years. I know it. But it's a, it's a, it's a same time. But if you were Satan, all you say, let's keep this stuff secret. Let me, show you, let me show you something. Go to first, it certainly does. Go to First Corinthians uh, chapter number 2. There's a reason he wants to keep a secret, because that, that's his stuff. When Paul says he was he spoiled them, making a show of them openly, he's talking about these principles. You know what Ephesians 6 says? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Satan knows that when, through, the, through Calvary, here's what God was doing to show them openly, when Jesus Christ ascended into the heavens, you know, he said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Matthew 28. <laughs> right after he... Well, let's look at it. What did I say? First Corinthians? Yeah. Chapter 2. Go to Matthew 28. He, <laughs> he declared that right there. Right now, looking at that, he showed that. It's like, oh yeah, there you go. Right there. Look at, look at Matthew 28. <clears throat> you guys are familiar with... Do you, are you guys familiar with the... You ever heard something called the Mount of Transfiguration? Mm -hmm. Where the Lord, you know, he's in his lowly body, but he brings Peter and James and John. And there he, he was transfigured. He, was, he glowed like the sun. And Peter was like, wow. Lord, we need, you know why he asked about three tabernacles? Because <clears throat> the Lord was there. The Lord Jesus Christ was there. Moses was there representing the law. Elijah was there representing the prophets. These are the two witnesses who are going to be there in Revelation. John the Baptist came in the spirit of power of Elijah. 
the Lord Jesus Christ came, as that prophet spoken of by Moses, had Israel received him and him, he would have, they would have got the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven was at hand. They rejected Elijah through, through John the Baptist, killed him. They, did, like they, they rejected Moses through the Lord Jesus, killed him. And God still was gracious, sent the Holy Ghost. When he says three tabernacles, those tabernacles represent the kingdom. Peter says, wait, hey, the kingdom's here. I see Moses, I see Elijah, I see you in glory, Lord. Lord, right after that, the Lord said, shh, tell no man I'm the Christ. Because what did he have to do before he gave him the kingdom? He had to die. And what, what he did at the Mount of Transfiguration was to show them his glory so that they might be patient through the tribulation. He showed them, he, he said, look, this is what's coming. And then right after they went down the mountain, he says, I have to die. And what did Peter say? Go, Lord. Not and the Lord looked up. Why was Satan there? Why was Satan there? When he said, get thee behind me, Satan. What, why, why was Satan there? He didn't want it to happen. Well, Satan was there because the Mount of Transfiguration is Mount Hermon over there in Lebanon today. It was the place where the fallen angels would come and receive worship from men. Mount Hermon. You can look it up right now. Mount Hermon. It's called the Anti-Lebanon Mountains. Okay, it's in Lebanon today in the Middle East. And that's the place where the Lord just walks right up there and was transferred. It's like he was kind of sticking it to say, he said, do you think y'all receive worship? He walked right to that. The Lord would do that. He would walk to these places and just appear and do things, and he's just kind of sticking it to Satan. But that's why Satan was right there, too. Interesting. But let me show you something that happened when he resurrected, okay? <clears throat> he appears to his... Now, 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 now look at verse 16, Matthew 28, 16. Then the eleven disciples, but by the way, one of them is missing. Who's missing? Judas, Judas is dead. He, he, he betrayed the Lord. He killed himself. Matthias hasn't been chosen. That's an act. That's, that's later in Pentecost, well, about 40 days after this, right? right? Okay. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Mountains represent kingdoms. And when they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me, where? In heaven and earth. So the question is, when he comes at the second coming on the earth, you can see that through the nation of Israel, there will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Uh, Exodus chapter number uh, 19. Peter tells him that too, a holy priesthood. <clears throat> but how is the Lord Jesus Christ going to exercise his authority, all his power in the heavenly places? Because he has power in heaven and earth. That's what the body of Christ was created for. That's why we're looking to those things. That's why Paul says up there, let me show you how, how much Satan hates that. Go to 1 Corinthians 2. You've heard of this verse, but now that you know these things, this verse should make a lot more sense. <laughs> Paul is talking, he said, do you know the mystery is, oh, the depths of the wisdom, both, oh, depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how uncertainly are his ways. There's his judgment, there's ways to pass finding out. God didn't let anybody know this stuff, man. Even Satan, who's the wisest creature God ever created, Lucifer, Satan, you can say, he had no clue that through the cross, God would reconcile both heaven and earth. God didn't tell anybody that. Look at chapter 2, verse number uh, 1 Corinthians. Did I say 1 Corinthians? Yeah. 2, verse 6. I'll, I'll let you get there, Joey. I want, I want you to see it. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6. That's why Paul says this. Because the way that God... See, Satan, Satan says, okay, okay. <clears throat> I'll let you be. You, you remember he, was, he offered the Lord... He says, he offered him the kingdoms of this world in a moment of time. He says, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. He's talking about the earthly kingdoms. Because he knew he'll still have the heavenly kingdom. He's... Heavens, what did, what, did, what, did they tell, what did Daniel tell the king? You know that God, the heavens, uh, rule over the affairs of men, right? So Satan, he could give anybody the kingdoms of this world, even all the earth, and knew that he still had the power in the heavens. He was, he was willing to count, hedge his bet and say, go ahead. But what he didn't know is through that sacrificial death that God the Father says, oh, that, that's, that humility, that suffering, you get everything, my son. You get all power in heaven and earth. Watch this. If Satan would have known that, look at, look at uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6. Howbeit, we speak wisdom. This is some wisdom. The, the Corinthians were, were Greeks. They said, give me some wisdom. God says, I got something for you here. 
We speak wisdom among them that are perfect. That has to do with spiritual maturity. Yet not the wisdom of this world. If you're trying to do things the way this world does, hey man, don't. Nor the princes of this world, the rulers and so forth, they come to naught. That stuff is ends in, in the lake of fire. But we speak the wisdom of who? God in a mystery. Paul's message is the mystery of Christ because this was hidden. Even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. The body of Christ, God had this thing already in mind. It was called the mystery. Which none of the princes of this world knew. Satan and his dominions. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Satan says, hey, have the earth, man. Go ahead. Because he knows the power of that innocent shed blood. And he says, nope. He would have said, leave him alone. Leave him alone. We still have the heavens. And God is a righteous God. He can't just kick us out without the... No, no, no. Somebody got to pay the price. Well, the Lord Jesus paid the price. And that's what he has offered for the believer today. But you have to suffer with it. Um, go with me. Um, get, get two passages. Get Romans chapter number 8, and then we'll end in 2 Timothy. Get Romans chapter 8. When Paul says, seek those things which are above, that's how you can endure in this world, knowing that you have this reward. Look at uh, Romans chapter number 8, if you will. Romans 8. Remember, Ephesians focus, their spousal books. Uh, We've got two minutes. Let me, let me end like this. The book of Ephesians and the book of Colossians, if you're a Bible student and you start reading them, you know they say a lot of similar things. You go, man, I just heard Paul say that in Ephesians. Well, it's a reason, because Ephesians, then you have Philippians, and then Colossians. These books go together. They're spouses, spousal books. Not just sister epistles, they're spousal. They're, this is the wife. This is the husband. This is the, 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 the body of Christ. This is Christ as the head. So these books, Ephesians presents God's love and devotion to the body of Christ. Colossians is our devotion to him. So even though they say similar things, like Colossians mentioned thrones, Ephesians doesn't mention thrones. Because all the children of God are heirs of God. But Colossians wants those heirs of God to be joint heirs of Christ, be faithful. So let me show you something. Look at Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter 8, verse number 17. Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs. Okay? We're children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, then heirs. Every member of the body of Christ, the moment you're saved, you've inherited heaven. You've got heaven in the bag. That your father gave you an inheritance. But just like the kings in Israel, not all the sons would reign. He would pick his firstborn, the one that he, the, the firstborn represented the power of his strength. Verse 17, and if children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs, that's equal heirs with Christ, and he calls them Christ and not Jesus and not the Lord, because Christ means you've got to suffer with him. If so be that we suffer with him. Now how is Christ suffering today? Not physical. Rejection. Rejection of his truth for today through the Apostle Paul. The, the, the mystery. If, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also what? Glorified to God. When God the Father has that coronation in the heavenly kingdom that he's going to have one day, it's going to be with Christ and with those joint heirs who suffer with him. Let's, That's let's what end. we look forward to. That's, That's the thing Paul keeps saying, set your affection, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Right. Not on things on this earth. Let's end over in 2 Timothy Get 2 Timothy 2 and 2 Timothy 4. Good, good place to end. 2 Timothy 2 and 2 Timothy 4. How can we endure? This world is crazy, man. Is Christ rejecting everything that we hold in value and esteem? They spit upon and they, they call good, evil, evil, good. And it drives you crazy. How can you endure to the Lord come? Because you know we're going we're gonna to keep thinking your mind, Lord. Because you have something for us. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. But in the same verse, if we deny him, he also will deny us. Now again, he's not going to deny your salvation. 
That's a gift by God's grace. What he's going to deny is the reign. He's going to say, welcome to the kingdom. Just like every kingdom had the ruling class and then the citizen. Same in the heavenly kingdom. It's no different. Even in Israel's kingdom and so forth. Like David. David and his family, the royalty, and then he had the, everybody. If you suffer, we should also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. And that's denying the, 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 the doctrine and suffering with him. And he tells you that's not your salvation. Because in verse 13, if we believe not... A believer cannot believe. Think about that. They can get saved and not walk in truth. People do it all the time. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, Christ is faithful, why? He cannot deny himself. You're a member of his body. You're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, Paul says. Now, let's end in chapter 4. Paul, as he talks about this kingdom, look at uh, verse number 18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. To whom be. Paul understood when he dies, because he's about to die, he says, I'm going there and I'm going to rule there. How do we know? Look at verse 6. We'll end in verse 6, 7, and 8. Here we go. For I am now ready to be offered. He saw his life as a sin offer, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a sacrifice. And the time of my departure is at hand. It's not like when John and Diane fly back to Minnesota. His soul is going to depart. It says about Rachel, when she died giving birth to Benjamin, you know, death is a process. Her soul was in departing, Genesis 35. That's why people say, man, I had an out-of-body experience. Because there's this umbilical cord of life. Just like when you come in with the umbilical cord, there was another one, and Solomon says when that silver cord is cut, that's why people can see themselves. They go, oh, I saw myself in opera. Yeah, your soul was a depart. And then they, they resuscitate you and bring you back. Paul understands his soul, his departure is at hand. It's right there. I have fought a good fight. He didn't notice until the Lord told him. Paul kept fighting to the end. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And it has to do with that doctrine committed to him there on the road to the master, the mystery. Henceforth, from here on, there is laid up for me a what? A crown, a, a king. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. Christ is a king of kings, and he's going to have some kings who rule with them. The, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, that's what the Lord means, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And that's the judgment seat of Christ. But here's the beautiful part, everybody who's listening. And not to me only, but unto how many? All them also that love his appearing. And that appearing in chapter 1 was that appearing on the road to Damascus and he, those visions and revelations called the mystery. You love that. Christ. Because that's why, how he suffers today. His, his truth is rejected. And if you believe it, you'll be rejected too. He says, okay. His long suffering and we long suffer with him, it'll be rewarding. That's why Paul says, set your affection on things above, not on things on earth. And I didn't get to my passage where, where David talks about that for Israel. We'll see that next week, all right? All right. Let's the Lord come. Let's come. All right. All right. If you're listening and you've never had anyone love you enough to ask you for to die today, do you know for sure where you're going to spend eternity? There's only one way to know for sure, and that's through the Word of God. And the Word of God says that you're a sinner who's separated from God because of your sin. You were born that way because of Adam and your parents. And God has one prescription. That's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Shed at Calvary. I took it down, but that's the answer. We saw it today. If you trust what he did, he died for your sins on that cross, and he rose from the dead, you believe in that. And that fact, that it's only him and his blood that can save you fully and freely. God will save you that moment forever. Now, the good works come in. The number one good work is what you're doing now. You're learning the word of God. You've got to develop his mind and understanding. God wants wise judges, wise kings, and that's what we use the rest of our time until he comes to uh, do. That's called sanctification. We'll help you with that. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in Him. We thank you for the wonderful good news, the glad tidings of your marvelous grace. Thank you for sending that uh, uh, chief of sinners, the Apostle Paul, the one, Saul of Tarsus, who, who had no claim over your grace. He, In fact, he was, he was a, a persecutor of, of your little flock of believers there in Israel. But you poured out your marvelous grace showing that even the worst can be saved. Um, even the one who was persecuting you and afflicting you, if he 
humbles himself, stop kicking against the pricks of pride, and humbles their heart to believe the word, the living word, you'll save them. And Father, you save us daily through the sanctification process of your spirit and your word. May we have a greater appreciation of your son after this study. May we go forth and have a desire to continue to learn and, and grow and learn more about him. That's why we exist here at North Cal Grace. Uh, thank you that we can be a part of helping others, not just here, but through uh, the blessing of technology, give it out to other people who can't be with us in the flesh. We thank you, Father. We pray for them as well. We thank you in the name of your Son, the precious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.